Good evening. Thank you. You're out there, yes. Welcome. So so wonderful to, to welcome you and to have an opportunity to open our lecture this evening. And uh, in a moment, we're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to say a few things about the lecture itself. And uh, even before then, I want to draw our attention to the fact uh, that we are wanting and needing to acknowledge with gratitude that we are gathered tonight in a city that takes its name from Chief Sialk, Chief of the Duwamish people, and our campus is situated on lands both seated and unseated of the Coast Salish peoples. The land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot nations, people who are still here today. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our annual Wilfred E. Weider Faculty Award Lecture for Meritorious Scholarship. The annual Weider Faculty Award Lecture was established in 1975 to honor Dr. Winifred E. Weider in the year of her retirement after she had served for 40 years as an SPU professor. The endowment to support the lecture was given by another SPU emeritus professor, Dr. Ross Shaw, who himself served at SPU for 31 years. The Weider Lecture provides a public platform in which the claims of the liberal arts in the Christian University are espoused. And each year, a faculty member is chosen by his or her peers to receive this award and to present scholarship informed by a Christian Worldview. In fact, this is one of the highest honors uh, the faculty bestows on its colleagues, and so it is a very special award indeed. Dr. Weider herself earned her doctorate in 1933 from the University of Chicago when she joined our university. She was one of the few members of the faculty who actually had an earned doctorate at the time, and she quickly set out to create first a new class and then a whole department for classical languages. And over the course of 40 years, her passion for languages and literature inspired countless students. She was also interested in physical education, which truly embodies the liberal arts. And she was SPU's first female coach, leading athletics programs for over a decade. This lecture is a wonderful tribute to the importance of scholarship in the vocation of the Christian University professor. And that legacy is something that lives on at SPU today. And we will be blessed this evening to hear our dear beloved professor share with us. And so it's exciting. If you would just bow your heads with me in a word of prayer, we will begin our evening. God in heaven, we thank you for the gift of scholarship we thank you for the mind to love you, to learn, to be intellectually curious, to apply ourselves to the discipline of study. And we don't take for granted the opportunity we have to serve you here at Seattle Pacific University. And Lord, we ask that you would be gracious to us this evening as we receive just wonderful scholarship, the fruit of scholarship, and that we would be challenged in our thinking, that we would be inspired, that we would be moved, that we would be educated, and that we would indeed truly become well-formed as a result. And so we commit this lecture to you and ask your blessing upon our beloved faculty member who will deliver this address. In Christ's name we pray, amen. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Carolyn Maurer, who will come and introduce our speaker. Good evening. My name is Caroline Maurer, and I'm the Assistant Provost for Faculty Development. It is my great honor to introduce our speaker for tonight's lecture, Dr. Alyssa Walter, Associate Professor of Middle Eastern History. Dr. Walter began her time at Seattle Pacific University in 2004 as a student. She was in the University Scholars Program and was a history major with a minor in Latin American Studies. 
During her time as a student at SPU, she participated in the Middle Eastern Studies Program with the CCCU and studied abroad in Egypt. Upon graduation, she moved to Cairo where she lived for one year before starting her studies at Georgetown University. While at Georgetown, she completed a master's in contemporary Arab studies and a PhD in Middle Eastern history, earning several awards for her studies focused on Iraq, including the USIP Peace Scholar Award issued by the United States Institute of Peace and the TAARII Research Fellowship issued by the American Academic Research Institute in Iraq. In 2018, Dr. Walter returned to SPU as an assistant professor of Middle Eastern history, and just recently, yes, very recently, she was promoted to associate professor of Middle Eastern history. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Walter began learning Arabic while studying abroad and today continues to hone her skills in both reading and writing Arabic as she completes much of her research in Arabic. In addition to have, having a professional working proficiency in the language, she is also regarded as an expert in Iraqi history and current country conditions. Dr. Walter has often been called upon to be an expert court witness for Iraqi refugees requesting asylum. In this role, she answers questions from the lawyers to help educate the judge on the conditions in Iraq and shares what might happen if a person does not receive asylum. Dr. Walter's areas of research and interest focus on society relations, in contemporary Iraqi and Egyptian history, refugees and forced migration, international development and gender. Her methods for data collecting include hearing people's stories and sharing their experiences. In her dissertation, the Ba'ath Party in Baghdad, State Society Relations Through Wars, Sanctions and Authoritarian Rule, 1950 to 2003, Dr. Walter examined how ordinary people in Baghdad experienced life under Saddam Hussein. In 2003, the Iraq war was a major turning point in the life and ways of Iraqi citizens. And tonight, Dr. Walter is here to share with us stories and perspectives from the Iraqi people regarding the 20 years after the Iraq war. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alyssa Walter as the speaker for the 2023 Winifred E. Weider Annual Lecture. Good evening, good evening. It's wonderful to see you all here. My family is here, my colleagues, my students, and members of the broader SPU community. Thank you. Um, and thank you um, also to President Menjares and to Carolyn Maurer for this warm welcome. And thanks to members of the Faculty Development Committee who selected my proposal last year and made tonight possible. So this spring marks the 20th anniversary of the US invasion of Iraq. The invasion began on March 19th, 2003, and on April 9th, a date we passed just two days ago, US forces entered the Iraqi capital city of Baghdad and toppled Saddam Hussein's regime, and the entire Iraqi state collapsed with it. Anniversaries can be a helpful invitation to reflect on the past. And as a Christian, for me, this anniversary invites spiritual reflection as well. As a Christian who is a professional historian, I have been guided in my research by God's calling to love, to love fully and widely, to love my neighbors, to love my enemies, and in fact, because of this higher calling to love, to do away with these categories altogether. And I have always felt strongly that in being called to love, we are also called to be curious, right? To want to 
learn about each other, to hear each other's stories? How can we love someone without wanting to know them, without wanting to hear their stories? And in sharing our stories, it becomes possible to stand together in empathetic relationship. And so I, as a Christian historian, I study history to more fully love and more fully know other people. And tonight, I invite us all to step into this posture of loving curiosity and empathy. So I am a researcher of Iraq, but I am not an Iraqi. And the stories I will be drawing your attention to tonight come from oral history interviews I've done with Iraqis, from memoirs and diaries written by Iraqis, and also from historical archives. And I share these stories with the utmost care and love and humility and respect. To Iraqis in the room who have joined us or on the live stream tonight, welcome and I'm so glad you're here. And I hope that my research accurately reflects the history and experiences of Iraq over the past few decades. And at the end of tonight's talk, I'll have a QR code with different resources by Iraqis, um, memoirs, podcasts, scholarship, so that you can hear directly from Iraqis themselves. So let us return now to the anniversary at hand. Undoubtedly, you've been seeing articles and posts about the 20th anniversary of the Iraq War, a lot of which has focused on like, the decision-making by the Bush administration. But if we start our reflections with the moment of the US invasion in 2003, like if we start the story there, it can distort our understanding running the risk of somehow both underestimating the impact of the US in Iraq and also overestimating it. And here's what I mean. If we start our reflections on Iraq with the US invasion in 2003, we risk underestimating the impact of US foreign policy on Iraq because that really started much, much earlier. From the perspective of many Iraqis, the US didn't start the war like didn't start waging war on Iraq in 2003. They started in 1990, and that the US was continuously in a state of war against Iraq from 1990 all the way until 2011, when the US withdrew most of its troops. And what the US public sometimes misses is that between the Gulf War in 1990 and the 2003 invasion, the US backed a 13-year period of really severe sanctions on the Iraqi people, and that we also occasionally bombed Iraq during that time. So if we don't talk about the Gulf War or the 13-year period of sanctions, we miss the full extent of the legacies of US action that continue to shape Iraq today. And then on the other hand, if we only talk about US action, if we only focus on US policy in Iraq, we run the risk of marginalizing Iraqis from their own history, of making the US a starring character in someone else's story. So it's a fine balance, and I'll do my best. Um, but so my goal today is to keep the focus on Iraqis, how they experienced the challenges of the past few decades, whether those challenges were caused by US foreign policy or caused by internal dynamics. So today, I'm not going to just focus on the 2003 war because I want to shed light on the other side of the story, the Iraqi side of the experience. Because the kinds of challenges that Iraqis have faced in recent decades have been existential, genocide, civil war, dictators and secret police, economic collapse, state collapse. And yet Iraqis are still here, resilient, fighting for a better future and a better tomorrow. So by walking through Iraq's recent history, from Saddam to the present, I want to shed light on the strategies that Iraqis have used to weather challenges, um, how individuals and communities have navigated their relationships with each other and with the state to not just survive, but to try to have a good life, to thrive, right? To live life to the fullest during these three challenging periods under Saddam's dictatorship, um, in the context of the 1990s with the Gulf War and sanction, and then yes, after the 2003 invasion. And my hope from this is that we leave here today with a clearer sense 
of the kinds of forces that can unite people or divide people in challenging circumstances. And with that, let's begin. So in the history department here at SPU, we like to disrupt stereotypes. And we talk a lot about um, what Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Adichie calls the danger of a single story. And many people outside of Iraq have only a single story about that country, which is Iraq as a war zone, right? So it's important for me that we actually start our history in 1950, when Iraq was experiencing a renaissance. From 1950 to 1980, Iraq was a rising star, a regional power within the Middle East. They were the envy of many for their high quality schools and their healthcare systems. And then Iraqi poets and artists and sculptors and intellectuals have always been the soul and center of Iraqi culture. And new art exhibits were showcased in these decades in particular. And the prosperity and development of these decades was funded by oil. Uh, Iraq has the fourth largest oil reserves in the world. And so for a period of 30 years, from 1950 to 1980, oil fueled these years of plenty. There were nightclubs and cinemas and chic hotels on the Tigris River. American architect Frank Lloyd Wright was even commissioned to create an opera house in Baghdad based on the Gardens of Eden. Had things gone differently, Iraq might look like Dubai today. Its future looked prosperous. In fact, an Iraqi friend of mine texted me just yesterday a video that's been circulating on social media. It's an old family film showing scenes of Baghdad in the 1970s, and she sent it to me. She said, it's heartbreaking to see how Baghdad was the most advanced city in the region, and then to look at it to today. So what changed? What, what happened? What disrupted this trajectory? Well, in 1968, the Ba'ath Party came to power in Iraq through a coup. Saddam Hussein was the vice president and quickly became sort of the power behind the throne. And the Ba'ath Party is thin on ideology. They're secular, kind of vaguely socialist, but all of these principles turned out to be negotiable. So later, Saddam swapped out socialism for market economics and substituted uh, secularism for a state-sponsored faith campaign. So Saddam Hussein sought power for the sake of power. And in 1979, Saddam officially became the president of Iraq. And he liked for citizens to refer to him in increasingly obsequious terms. Is Sayyid al-Rais al-Qa'id al-Mujahid al-Batil Saddam Hussein hafadahu Allah wa Mr. President, the warrior hero, though father of all Iraqis would also do. He built up an extensive cult of personality around himself. So his face on gold watches and murals and public sculptures, it appeared everywhere. The years of plenty and prosperity for many Iraqis came to an end in 1980, when Saddam, as the new president of Iraq, led the country on an eight-year war against their neighbor, Iran. And this turns out to be the fateful decision that changed the entire trajectory of the country, setting off a chain of events that leads to the present day. So the cause of the war was that in 1979, the neighboring country of Iran had a religious revolution that propelled the Shiite cleric Ayatollah Khomeini into power. Saddam received U.S. support to stop the spread of the Iranian revolution and to try to unseat the new regime there. Now, the irony, of course, is that Donald Rumsfeld, this is for the Gen Z in the room, Donald Rumsfeld <laughs> would later serve as the Secretary of Defense leading the war against Saddam in 2003. But Saddam also received large loans from Gulf countries like Kuwait to fight against Iran. The war against Iran solidified Saddam's rule over the country, but it devastated the population. There were one million casualties in a country that at the time only had a population of 17 million. The Iran-Iraq war saw the use on both sides of child soldiers, 
of landmines, of trench warfare. Conscripted soldiers were sent on these never-ending tours of duty, postponing their lives for nearly a decade. And women were female-headed households during these years. They went to work to support the war effort, and then they were told to bear more sons to make up for the lost lives of this generation. So for critics of the war and critics of Saddam, especially Iraqi Shiites with sympathy for Iran's new religious government next door, formed underground opposition groups during these years. Many were tortured and executed by the regime's secret police, and others sought safety in exile. After 2003, these groups would come back from exile and become the new rulers of Iraq. But there were other Iraqis persecuted during the war too. Under the cover of war, Saddam ordered a genocide against Iraq's Kurdish ethnic minority in the north. He accused them of siding with Iran against their own country in an effort to break off and form their own state. This genocide against Iraqi Kurds murdered anywhere between 50 and 100,000 people killed with poison gas or executed in mass graves. The US would later point to this genocide and the use of chemical weapons as justifications for the 2003 US invasion. As I said, Iraqis have faced existential threats, war, genocide, a ruthless dictator. But unfortunately, things were about to get even worse. So after the war with Iran ended in 1988, Iraqis were so relieved, so eager to finally get back to the act of living, right? To marry, to spend time with their families, to start their careers in earnest, to go back to college. And Saddam was also eager to kickstart the country economically. So there was a lot of optimism. There was a lot of like new development projects happening all over the country. And had that continued, again, history would look very different. One woman that I interviewed, she's a lawyer and a community leader. She was telling me how 1988 and 1989 were these really precious years. She and other Iraqis wanted to move forward past the grief and the loss of war. But as she said, we had only two years before Iraq entered another war. Oil prices were low in 1989 and 1990, and this was hurting Iraq's recovery, economic recovery after the war, and Saddam wanted a quick fix. So in 1990, Saddam decided to invade their southern neighbor, Kuwait, a small oil-rich country. And even though Kuwait had supported Iraq in its war against Iran, Kuwait refused to forgive the millions of dollars of loans Saddam decided that invading and annexing Kuwait, like making it part of Iraq, would solve all of Iraq's financial problems in one fell swoop. It would cancel their debt and they would get all of Kuwait's oil. The decision to invade Kuwait was the decision that set the US and Iraq on a collision course for the next 20 years. So Iraq occupied Kuwait from August 1990 until February 1991. And the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait was brutal for the civilians that were living in Kuwait at that time. That's another topic I've done research on, and it can't be understated. I don't want to sort of brush by this. But when we read the diaries of Iraqi soldiers that were, these diaries were left behind on the battlefield and then later preserved in archives. When we read these diaries, the picture that emerges is that many conscripted soldiers were utterly demoralized. They didn't want to be there. They had already served in many cases for years against Iran. And as this soldier poetically expressed in his diary, all his plans, those precious two years of getting their lives back were gone and his life had become nothing but a black piece of cloth. Many soldiers began to desert the army, going on leave and never coming back. In January 1991, the US and its allies moved to the offensive phase of the war known as Desert Storm. So for six weeks, the US and its allies rained down bombs on Iraqi positions in Kuwait, 
right? Which makes sense. But crucially, they also bombed the capital city of Iraq, Baghdad. And bombing Baghdad, even though it was a civilian city, right, was meant to pressure Saddam to surrender and withdraw troops. So Baghdadis who lived through these six long weeks of bombardments, like Iraqi sculptor Nuha al-Radi, was bitter towards the West and bitter towards Saddam. So she wrote, this is a diary that she later published, that they lived for 40 days trying to survive intense US bombardments in a war that was never their idea to begin with. Iraqis were not the ones advocating to invade Kuwait, but they were the ones facing death each day while Saddam was safe in a secured bunker. US bombs targeted civilian infrastructure in Baghdad, power stations, bridges, runways, hospitals, and water treatment plants. The damage was estimated at $232 billion in just six weeks of bombing. One survey by the UN concluded that during this time in 1991, Baghdad had, quote, no public electricity, no telephones, no gasoline for civilian vehicles, and only 5% of their normal drinking water. So you can see the human toll on the civilians in Baghdad, such as in the memoirs of Iraqi journalist Khaith Abdul Ahad. He wonders at the end, will life ever be the same after this? And the truthful answer is no. The city has never recovered, even to the present day. And the lasting damage, the reason that these consequences live on is because of sanctions. The UN, with strong backing from the US, imposed these sanctions starting in 1990. And the purpose of sanctions initially, right, was to pressure Saddam to leave Kuwait. But then even after the Gulf War ended, the sanctions remained. And now the sanctions had a different purpose. It was meant to weaken Saddam, to try to turn the Iraqi people against Saddam, and also to ensure he couldn't resume production of chemical weapons and poison gas, which we knew he had used in the 80s. These sanctions remained in place for 13 years and were lifted only when the US invaded Iraq in 2003. So in their earliest form, um, these economic sanctions were a complete blockade. Nothing comes in, nothing comes out, meaning Iraq was not allowed to sell any oil that makes up its entire national income. And even if Iraq had income, nothing was allowed to come in, no imported goods. There were supposed to be exceptions for food and medicine, but there was a committee at the UN that needed to review each shipment coming into the country to make sure it didn't violate the terms. So in practice, there were severe shortages and difficulty getting medicine. So the work of rebuilding Baghdad after these six weeks of bombings was almost impossible. Cement and rebar, clearly needed to rebuild the city, were forbidden. Those were not approved items because they could be used to build like a military base. So to this day, Baghdad's infrastructure is failing and it stems back from this moment in 1991. As one man, um, I was part of a research team that interviewed him and he, stated that since these bombings in 1991 that took out electrical grids and other infrastructure, there has never been a quality systematic rebuilding of the country from Saddam until now. So what did sanctions look like for ordinary Iraqis? What is life like for them in the country? I said that Iraq used to have an educational system and healthcare system was that, that was the envy of the whole region, right? Like people used to go to Iraq to go to university or to get a surgery. And all of that vanishes during the sanctions because the value of the Iraqi currency collapsed. So middle-class professionals, I'm talking about doctors and teachers and lawyers, professors, pharmacists, they had public sector salaries. And because of the currency collapse, they were only earning an average of $3 a month. And no, that didn't buy you anything. It's not like, oh, it goes really far. It doesn't go very far. So many just stopped going to work. Why would you work 
for free, essentially, right? Or others fled abroad, a massive brain drain of the country, and it hollowed out the country of their most skilled and talented professionals. Sanctions did that. The artist Nuhal Radi tells another story in her diary about a friend who went to the hospital for a routine surgery. And when he arrived, there were no sheets, no heat, no light bulbs, and frequently not medicine for what you needed. Anyone with cancer in the 90s had to leave the country. Universities, the top university in the country, had no paper. This is what life was like under sanctions. And starvation would have been a real threat at this time, except that Saddam stepped in and provided government food rations to every man, woman, and child, and they were distributed monthly. A man I interviewed was telling me how his monthly salary lasted him about two days. And after that, he had to rely on government food rations to survive the rest of the month. And milk and animal protein became luxury goods available only to the upper classes. Oh, sorry, I was off on, anyway. Ah, yes, sorry. Um, a former school teacher was interviewed by a researcher in the 90s, and she was explaining how without food rations, uh, she simply could not raise her child. Her husband had been killed in the war, and they went hungry at the end of each month. So sanctions were so restrictive, so all-encompassing, that they were a form of collective punishment. And this is what I mean when I said that the American public sometimes underestimates the impact of US policy on the lives of Iraqis by not taking this full scenario of sanctions into account. So how do people survive this? There's a triple threat. You have the Gulf War bombings, you have sanctions, and you're still living under a dictator. How did people get by? Well, some Iraqis responded with rebellion and uprisings. So in 1991, as Iraqis were retreating from Kuwait, mass uprisings swept across the country. People were fed up. In the Kurdish North that had just survived a genocide, the uprisings were particularly fierce and they succeeded in breaking away, forming a semi-autonomous region of Iraq that remains under regional self-rule to the present. Iraqis in the southern part of the country rose up as well but Saddam was able to crush these rebellions, turning his helicopter gunships on crowds of people. A woman I interviewed mentioned that when people went back to university after the Gulf War in 91, people were missing and never heard from again, whether they had fled abroad or been captured or killed because of their participation. And no one could talk about it at that time because of fear of the regime. So how else did people survive? Well, more quietly, these groups of exiles, these opposition groups underground continued to plot against Saddam. One particularly influential and small group of exiles, they called themselves Iraqi National Congress. They began to hold meetings in the 1990s with US foreign policy officials. This is what paved the way for the Iraq war years before 9-11. And inside Iraq, people found ways to push back and show their dissatisfaction. Soldiers continued to desert from compulsory military, even though they risked amputation as a form of punishment. They had huge numbers of deserters who simply couldn't take it anymore. People resorted to black markets and smuggling and theft to stay afloat financially. But the problem was the very things that might help you survive sanctions, like selling goods on the black market, are the very things that would get you arrested. And so the safest route for many was actually to turn towards Saddam, whether you liked him or not, because the government was the only people around that had any resources. They were feeding you food. So some people wrote letters to Saddam asking for food or medicine or money. So in this petition from the archives, a young woman wrote to Saddam, right, calling him the father of all Iraqis, as you do, in the hope of receiving financial assistance for her family. And this isn't rare. I came across dozens of these petitions in the archives. People also volunteered to be informants as another kind of survival strategy. By ratting on your neighbors or even family members, you at least ensured that you were in good standing with the regime, that you got food. The problem in this environment is that no one knew who they could trust. So even though sanctions were meant to weaken Saddam, they had the opposite effect. 
People turn toward the regime because the regime is the one providing food. They are the only ones with resources. So this is the situation Iraqis were living in on the eve of the 2003 war. Devastated economically, living in paranoia about informants and secret police, failed by their public systems, grieving those lost in war or disappeared. And so it isn't a total surprise that at least some Iraqis expressed a kind of cautious optimism about what the US invasion would bring, that the US could remove a dictator and usher in a period of freedom and prosperity, a dignified future they had been waiting for since 1980. But of course, still many more resented the idea of any foreign army occupying their country, no matter what they thought of Saddam. One friend of mine, this wonderful Iraqi woman who was hosting me in her home in Baghdad, told me how she just cried when she saw the US tanks rolling into her city, just crying at what it felt like to be occupied. Now, as Iraqis have remembered the 20th anniversary of the occupation, stories have been circulating on Twitter talking about the fear, the terror, the humiliation of having their homes searched by foreign soldiers. And even in the best case scenario, when every correct military protocol was followed, foreign soldiers banging on your door in the middle of the night to search your house would fill anyone with dread. One colleague told me how her house was searched five times in the span of just a few years. Another colleague of mine who was a teenager in 2003 was detained for nine days by US forces. And this isn't even to mention Americans' use of torture in Abu Ghraib prison. To fully understand the impact of the US invasion on the lives of Iraqis, I encourage you all to read accounts by survivors of US torture. I'll include a link at the end. It's a bitter thing to be occupied by a foreign army, no matter how much you hated a dictator. There are three consequences of the US invasion of Iraq that I want to highlight for you, briefly, I promise, shining a light on how the lives of Iraqis were impacted. And the first of these factors is corruption. After Saddam was toppled, the US embarked on a process called reconstruction, right? Rebuilding the country, but also introducing um, democratic systems and market-oriented uh, economic systems. But unfortunately, reconstruction was a failure. And this is a conclusion reached by the US government's own internal auditor. Problems stemmed from the problem uh, or from the practice of the US flying in literal planefuls of cash in a security environment where there were armed groups competing for power and a political system that was in flux. And I did lots of interviews with both Americans and Iraqis who were involved in like reconstruction projects and they all told me variations on kind of the similar scenario. So imagine you need to build a school, right? A school is needed, this neighborhood is underserved. Okay, whether or not this is funded by the Iraqi government or the US or an NGO, doesn't matter. A school will be built. An armed group will come to you and said, I understand you have a contract that you're going to award so that a company will build this school. You will award this contract to my friend or relative or party supporter. And at this point you have two choices, right? You can say, I'm not scared, I'm not threatened by you and you go off and you try to find another contractor. The problem is that work will probably never get done because this armed group will indeed make problems. They will attack, they will threaten, right? People will be scared. The other problem is that whatever other company you find may not be any more honest, right? Um, the corruption might be the same thing. So after a while, people started just saying, okay, all right, whoever you, we award the contract to as long as the school gets built. But then the problem is that you will both overpay and they will under deliver. So the contract will be inflated 10 times above the actual cost because there's going to be kickbacks and skim offs and bribes. And then if the school is ever built at all, it will not be to code, it will not be adequate, and you will be forced to pay bribes along the way to just get the project done. This is how billions and billions of dollars were lost. Um, speaking just about Iraqi public funds, not about US taxpayer dollars, just Iraqi money, an estimated $150 billion has been lost to fraud and embezzlement since 2003. This was an Iraqi president at the time stating that number, so the real figure might be even higher. 
Just a few months ago, top officials embezzled $2.5 billion out of the tax accounts and fled the country. Meanwhile, the electricity system still doesn't work. In the capital, everyone has private power generators. The power goes out many times a day, all in a country with the largest, one of the largest oil reserves in the world. They should have the best, right? And if we're looking at the impact of corruption on the lives of Iraqi citizens, it looks like this. The average Iraqi adult pays four bribes per year. These are bribes for routine government functions like getting a pothole fixed in your street or a broken sewer line addressed, applying for college, applying for a job. One study, here's for my students, one study found that Iraqi college graduates to get a job after graduation are paying up to 10,000 US dollars to get hired. And if the job actually materializes and you weren't just scammed for your money, you can expect to pay a portion of your paycheck going forward. So it's no surprise that youth unemployment is at 36%. And the problem's getting worse, not better, because bribes have become ingrained. The second, uh, right, and so bribes now simply are out in the open. It's not secret, it's not hidden. The second major consequence is sectarianism. And this word gets thrown a lot, around a lot, so let me explain what I mean. So from 2003 to 2004, after the overthrow of Saddam, there was no Iraqi government for a period of time. Like the US just governed Iraq directly through an office called the Coalition Provisional Authority or CPA. And this was led by US Ambassador Paul Bremer. And the CPA, this US government in Iraq, created an advisory council called the Governing Council. And it was made up of Iraqis that were meant to help prepare the way for an eventual transition to, to set up the new sovereign Iraqi government. And this uh, advisory council was populated entirely by exile groups, right? People who had fled Saddam. Uh, most were religious Shiite opposition groups. Some were Kurds, a few were secular intellectuals. And now that Saddam was gone, this eclectic group of exiles came back and they were working closely with the US government to inherit power. And amongst themselves, this diverse bunch of exiles decided that the most fair way to govern would be to share power amongst themselves. So they proportionately allocated seats based on ethnicity and religion. So in Iraq, the largest demographic group are Arab Shiites. So they get the most seats. And then Arab Sunnis and Kurds and Christians and other minority groups get smaller allocations based on their population. And the idea is to make sure that everyone's represented, right? In this new post-Saddam government, everyone has a stake, everyone has a role, and that's a worthy objective, right? The problem is that power sharing simply on the basis of identity sidelines the actual work of politics, right? Policies and ideas and programs aren't what get you elected. It's just who you are and who you represent. The US backed this quota system, we endorsed it. And then when the new sovereign Iraqi government was formed in 2004, and the US is very involved in this, this quota system gets baked into the new Iraqi government and into the new Iraqi constitution. So to this day, the prime minister of Iraq has to be an Arab Shiite, cannot be anyone other than an Arab Shiite, no matter how gifted a leader a Kurd or Sunni might be. And all of the ministries got divided. Arab Shiites get half of all the government ministries and other ministries get allocated. So it's divisive. Rather than unifying diverse populations under some larger goal, something that we're all working towards, the system divided group against each other. Now add to this the issue of corruption, and you begin to see the problem. Because the point of controlling a government ministry isn't to actually govern anymore. So for example, let's take the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health was awarded to a very prominent Shiite political party. Are they going to use the Ministry of Health to finally rebuild and restore the failing health system that has been like devastated by sanctions? No. They will use the ministry to give jobs to their Shiite party supporters 
to embezzle money from the Ministry of Health budget to benefit Shiite militias, and they'll set up fraudulent contracts for Shiite businessmen. And it's not just Shiites, I'm just using them as an example. It's every political party, it's every group. And this is why the healthcare system is still failing. It's this combined like, effect of sanctions, bombings, corruption, sectarianism. And what started in politics spilled out into the streets. And this is my third and final point, which is about the legacies of the US war, which is violence. So in 2003 and four, this, you know, in the initial invasion, there's an anti-US insurgency that forms, you know, people who simply resent the presence of foreign troops. And in this atmosphere, militias begin to form to represent different sectarian and ethnic groups. And so there's Shiite militias and Sunni extremist groups soon join the scene. And there were also a few bad actors that are important to note. There were some foreign extremists, non-Iraqis, who came to Iraq after the invasion with the express purpose of fomenting a sectarian civil war. So that greatly exacerbated the problem. But there simply isn't a way to adequately convey the heartache and terror and devastation of the violence that came after 2003. A friend of mine who witnessed the murder of a shopkeeper in his street, a colleague who was kidnapped and held for ransom, colleagues whose coworkers started disappearing, their bodies found later in the streets. These are the stories you need to hear directly from Iraqis. These are their stories, those who lived through it. The terror of people simply trying to go to school and go to the grocery store and risking their lives every time they stepped out their door. During the peak years of violence from 2005 to 2008, there were only two ways to survive at that time. You had to seek protection with your ethnic or sectarian group, even if you never cared about that ethnic or sectarian identity before, or you had to leave. Around 300,000 Iraqi civilians died after 2003 from war and armed conflict. There are currently, today in 2023, 9.2 million displaced Iraqis, either displaced inside their country or living abroad as refugees. Between corruption, violence, no state services, loved ones lost, it's no wonder that many Iraqis today actually rate life before 2003 as better than life after 2003. There's actually a growing nostalgia for Saddam when at least terror and violence were predictable and state services worked. One interviewee stated, before 2003, people lived in despair. He is not sugarcoating what life was like before 2003. We were looking forward to something good, but we are shocked that there is nothing good to mention. It is worse. Someone else stated it even more bluntly. Things were bad before. After 2003, they got even worse. One of the extremist groups that formed after 2003 was called Tawheed Wal Jihad, and they renamed themselves ISIS. ISIS did not exist in Iraq before 2003. Their creation was made possible by the changes unleashed by the US war. ISIS waged war on Iraq Shiites. They also attempted genocide on Iraq's Christians and another religious group called the Yazidis. Now I happened to meet with some Iraqi Christian families in 2016. During the week that the battle to defeat ISIS started, I was sitting with them in their living room. And these families I spoke with actually were originally from Baghdad. They had lived there for generations and they had left their homes in Baghdad after 2003 because of the sectarian fighting. And then they moved to Nineveh province. That's Nineveh. That's the home uh, and the, the, the burial of the prophet Jonah. Nineveh in Iraq is home to Christian communities that are some of the oldest Christian communities in the world. Christians in Iraq speak Neo-Aramaic as a living first language. The families I sat with had just started to rebuild their lives in Nineveh when ISIS attacked, uprooting them for a second time. Now today, Karakosh, this is where this family I met with was from, 
Today, Karakosh has been rebuilt. Pope Francis visited there. But Christian survivors of ISIS genocide wonder if there's a future for them in Iraq. There were as many as 1.4 million Christians in Iraq before 2003. It was one of the largest Christian communities in the Middle East. The number of Christians in Iraq fell by 80% after 2003. And for those of us who consider ourselves American Christians, we need to grapple with this particular legacy of the war, the devastation of Iraq's Christian communities. So where are things at today and where is their hope? I'm sorry, I know I haven't given you very much. My students know all my classes are super depressing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, there is, there, are, there is silver lining, let me tell you. There is a new sense of calm and security in Iraq today compared to what the last two decades have looked like. I visited Baghdad twice in the last year. There's nightlife, there's restaurants. Saddam's palaces are re being like remade into like these gaudy but amazing riverside restaurants. They're very cool. Um, <laughs> there's even like a couch surfing scene that started up. I meet European backpackers coming through Iraq. Um, and so Iraqis I interview have tell me that they're glad that they have freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is this one positive legacy that they can point to. Um, there's lack of fear about the political system. And someday, I hope, the electricity grid can eventually be rebuilt. But freedom, that's something that can't be taken for granted, especially in a region that has so many authoritarian regimes. However, as I've explained tonight, there are very few positive legacies to point to when looking at the role of US foreign policy on the lives of Iraqis. But the future might be changing. There's change now, not from top-down forces, not from dictators, not from foreign armies, but from the grassroots. In 2019, thousands and thousands of young people, people born after 2003 who have only known violence and instability and corruption, took to the streets for months long protests in the South, in the North, and in Baghdad. People occupied main squares for months. And these protests weren't against one particular leader or one particular policy. It was against the entire sectarian corrupt system. The chance of the protesters was Nurid Watan. We want a country. We want a country. We want to be Iraqis. We don't want to be Sunnis and Shiites. We want to be Iraqis with a government that works, with systems that function, and they function for everyone. Now, these protests ended in early 2020. Hundreds of protesters were killed by security forces and militias, and then COVID came next. So there is a long, hard path ahead of Iraq to achieve that national unity that the next generation is just yearning for. But this is the hope being expressed, that the political structures can change so Iraqis can survive and, yes, thrive in the future, not as individuals, not as divided communities, but as a country. Thank you. Um, I'm Margaret Watkins, I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and uh, I just want to get us started with our Q&A, but first um, to thank Professor Walter, who is a testimony to the excellence of the history department, both past and present. Um, and <laughs> so we have um, some time for q and I'll get us started, as I said, but uh, uh, our Dean of the School of Theology, Dr. Brian Luyoho, is also um, here with a microphone. If you have questions that you would prefer to write on note cards, those are available as well, and he can collect those um, as we proceed. And I thought I would just get us started. I'm, I'm really struck by your interviewing 
the Iraqi people. And I wondered if you could say a word about how you established the trust that would be necessary to have those conversations. Thank you so much. So oral history to me has been just, I don't know, I, what are the words for it? Just the most um, incredible form of research. Um, archives are amazing and I love them, but it's, you know, I work on such contemporary periods of history that, you know, Iraqis are the experts and have the stories and it's them I want to be listening to. Um, so oral history interviews though are tricky and my positionality as an American is interesting. It actually isn't always a hindrance, but it's a factor. Um, and sometimes kind of being the visiting outsider, people are like, oh, let me explain. Like, let me walk you through this because you clearly don't know, right? And that's great. Um, and other times it takes working through some, some uh, some trust building. Um, and so the first time I did oral history interviews was in 2016, and it was my first time going to Iraq. Um, and I went to this Kurdish region in the north, because at the time that was the only part of the country Americans could get visas to easily, um, and it was considered safer. Um, and so I flew in, and I didn't fully realize that this the week I was going to be there was the week when the war to defeat ISIS was starting. Um, and the front lines were 20 miles from where I was staying. Um, and I'm a historian and I'm not very courageous and I was not, I don't know, this was not what we're trained for in graduate school as historians. <laughs> um, but anyway, I would say, of course, I was very, I, people were coming to the city I was in, Erbil, because it was safe. This was like the regional government's uh, headquarters. So anyway, um, so I was there and um, everyone is, you know, glued to the news, glued to the television. Um, there's so many journalists coming and I've talked to my students too about how interesting it is to watch war reporting up close. Um, and then I'm like, I'm a historian um, and I want to talk to you about food rations in the 90s. And so people were kind of caught off guard, but also like, oh yeah, 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 like we'll tell you anything you want about food rations, like this is in no way sensitive. And so in some ways coming in with a really banal historical topic, um, people are like, sure, like this is no longer sensitive. Um, recently, so um, a lot of, I have to give a lot of thanks and credit also to like research teams I've been a part of. And so recently I collaborated with a sociologist at Baghdad University and he and I are co-authoring a paper. And so he and his students were really instrumental in collecting a whole bunch of oral history um, interviews that I would have had a harder time talking to people about, not just because of language, but positionality. Um, but for example, I've done other interviews with um, people who did like these like neighborhood councils that the Americans were setting up. The Americans had all these ideas about like decentralizing and like doing like grassroots democracy, but in kind of um, odd and unsuccessful ways. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but so I was interviewing these Iraqis who had been part of these efforts to create neighborhood councils and at incredible risk to themselves. I think one estimate is that 30% of all council members were assassinated. Um, yeah, so the people who were doing, and they were not, they weren't very well, at first they were just volunteer positions, then they got a small salary. But anyway, so I was interviewing these folks, and these were folks who had worked very closely with Americans and wanted to talk about their, their achievements. And so for me to come in um, was very easy to establish rapport with them, and those were some really incredible interviews, yeah. Other questions? Brian, right up here. <laughs> How has this uh, research and um, study changed you? Oh, well, that's a great question. Oh, in so many ways. Um, I carry these stories with me all the time. And I'm really careful to, to state these are not my stories, right? Um, and yet I feel a great responsibility as a caretaker of stories um, that I have been told or that I've come across in the archives. Um, and there's a, a tenderness and a heaviness that comes with them. And there have been times when I've been deep in a research project where you know, you're, I'm putting in six, eight hours a day just with these stories, with these sources, um, that it really takes a toll and I kind of need to step back. And this is something, again, I try to model with my students because I make them read some of these things too. Um, but it has given me um, 
a lot of affection um, and admiration for the way that Iraqis have coped, whatever that coping has looked like. Um, and I think it's also disabused me. Like a lot of times we talk about um, rebel groups. Like it depends if we like them or not, right? But it's like uh, rebel groups here and resistance groups there. And you're like, I don't know. Um, I, it's kind of all less romantic when you, it, it's kind of you're just in a an, an, a an unsettled kind of power vacuum and you're simply trying to figure out what do I do? Um, I think it looks less glossy the more time you get to spend kind of up close with these stories and experiences. Thank you. I'm sure there's a lot more, but I'll, I'll keep thinking about your question. Thank you for that. Hi, Alyssa. If you were on the advising group of the first George Bush or the second George Bush, uh -huh. would you have recommended that the United States simply let things happen? Hmm. So they say about historians that we're like those people where like after you have like a fight with your friend, like you go home and you think of all the things you should have said. And like historians, we get to do that like professionally. Like we get to be like, well, if I had done that 20 years ago. Um, I think, I think the, the tasks in front of everyone were Im impossible tasks and the stakes were impossibly high and I don't pretend that having clarity or wisdom in those moments is an easy thing. I will say that it was a choice for the US to topple another country's government. And so there's a responsibility that comes from collapsing someone else's state. Um, however, and I say this with the full benefit of hindsight and knowing that in the moment, I'm sure I would have had no better clue than anyone else, but um, I do think that there has to be a higher, greater purpose that everyone coalesces around. And we talk about this at SPU too, like what's the center that's going to hold that can bring everyone here? The center is Jesus, right? For us at SPU, what is the center? And Saddam had made himself the center and he placed the state on this brittle ground. He wanted to be irreplaceable. He wanted things to fall apart if he was to be removed. But to not replace Saddam with something higher and greater that unifies everyone, the outcome is what we see today. And so it's, it's hard. I think um, the US had a somewhat mistaken view of um, how ethnic and minority and religious minority groups were relating to each other under Saddam. And again, I've like, they were, we were on the outside. It's like trying to understand kind of inside a black box. I, I say that with like full respect for like the work of analysts. I think they were trying their best to understand. Um, but I think the State Department came in thinking, oh, this is how Iraq works. Okay, there's Sunnis, there's Shiites, there's Kurds. We have these puzzle pieces. Iraqis themselves largely did not experience life that way. They were like, we're Iraqis. There's different social classes. There's, yeah, we have different layers of identity, but it wasn't so broken apart. And so the US and the exile group that was really heavily advising them essentially tried to like fix a problem that wasn't broken. Because they were like, well, these soon, you know, Shiites have been discriminated against was the idea. So we need to make sure that they have X number of seats at the table. But the reality actually was just not that. It was just more complicated or nuanced than that. But that that's mostly about second George Bush. Oh. Because the first George Bush oh. simply said, you know, we're going to take care of our own people. Thank you for so politely letting me answer a question that you did not ask. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> you were very kind about that. So this is interesting. Um, so, so George W. Bush, sorry, George Bush Sr. H. Thing, uh, anyway, sorry, the, the, the father. That's what they call him in Iraq. They're just like Bush the father, Bush the son. Uh, OK, yeah, so Bush the father. Um, uh, so on the one hand, he at the time was praised by many people for, for doing this limited war by saying the UN only authorized this coalition to push Saddam out of Kuwait, but did not authorize regime change. 
and he did not. And a lot of people said, look, that's the international system working. He also got a ton of criticism because they were like, we were right there. We could have just taken him out at the time, right? I just, I think the US has, I'm gonna offer an opinion. Okay, <laughs> the US tried twice in, in the war on terror context to topple a government and make it over better. And I don't think it worked. And so I would be, I don't know, I think I just, I have too much trepidation to, to say that regime change would have been a better course of action in 1991. That's tricky. No, would I, uh, sorry. Now we got double negatives, okay. Um, yeah, no, so I think that I would not advocate for regime change broadly, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Walter. This was wonderful. I learned so much, and our offices are near each other, um, but this was awesome. Um, you talked a lot about how your identity as an American shaped um, kind of your interactions with people, but I'm curious to know how your identity as a Christian shapes your interactions with Iraqis when you're over there. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think actually, so my identity as a Christian, I'll talk broadly, but when I travel in the Middle East as a Christian, um, it feels like the most natural thing in the world because um, people understand, and I'm talking, people in Muslim majority context understand who Christians are and understand how to relate to Christians. What they don't understand is someone who's an atheist, you know? So I'm just like, no, no, I'm also a person of faith and I'm from an Abrahamic tradition. Um, it, it has been lovely and beautiful and I've had wonderful relations and lots of open doors. The relationship between the Western church and the different Christian communities of the Middle East is strained and estranged. I mean, one of the things that um, I think has been so heartbreaking for Iraqi Christians is that they watched American Christians largely line up for the war. I mean, I, I'm saying broadly, like Congress voted majorities to vote for the war. A lot of Americans were lining up for the war. But so to see um, American Christians not connect the dots, right, and not realize, oh, these policies are going to impact Iraqi Christians, and then not care, or not notice, or not track that as a major issue. It was a little different with ISIS. I saw more recognition um, because Iraqi Christians were then being persecuted for their faith. And so the Western church kind of like realized what was going on a little bit. But overall, I just feel that there hasn't been a lot of solidarity or partnership or relationships between Western Christian communities, and whether it's Christians in Iraq or Palestine or Egypt um, and, and other communities. And so um, I guess this is just kind of like my call to myself and my call to all of us is to look for opportunities to better build those ecumenical relationships. The, I was just with a, an Assyrian Christian colleague of mine. She's an academic as well. And she wrote an amazing book about Assyrian Christians. That's in the QR code. Um, but she's like, look, it's not just that we're Christians. It's that we are the caretakers of an Assyrian culture and language. And we, this is disappearing. I mean, we are going to lose whole cultures if we cannot somehow help protect or, or advocate for these communities. And the issue is politics. It's politics, it's political structures. If you say it's all by demographic size, they're a minority, a very small minority. They get like one seat on things. And so until the structure changes, they can't be integrated. I, I don't mean, I always struggle to I bring up this example. One of Saddam's top officials, top officials was a Christian. He wasn't a nice guy. I mean, I don't want to be like, he wasn't like that kind of Christian. But anyway, um, <laughs> but that's how integrated Iraqi Christians were. And it is night and day today. So I think I actually feel more like an outsider sometimes because I'm, I'm still learning so much about the Chaldean church, the Assyrian church, the church of the East, the Syriac church. There are so many different, really rich, amazing Christian communities. And as a Protestant, I'm not as well versed in some of their traditions as I'd like to be. Thank you. Um, so you are a professor that teaches um, history and representation, which looks at art throughout um, history. I have not taken it, but I will take it from you next year. Um, 
But I noticed in the protest photos from 2019 and 2020 that you showed that the Freedom Monument was portrayed in the background and that it was still there from the 60s. Yeah. Um, do you... Do you find that symbolic in any way, or is it just serendipitous? Oh, no, yeah. This was definitely, I mean, the protesters, like in thinking about um, kind of symbolic spaces where they are going to have their protest, right? So it's a huge square, so that helps, right? Like they're going to come to this large area where they can gather. But for sure, I mean, that... The, the Freedom Monument is an incredible source of pride um, and and super, right? Like, it's called Liberation Square, like Tahrir, right? We This is the same... It's a common name in a lot of cities. Cairo has a liberation square as well. Um, but for sure, it was, and, and that it was occupied. And then um, the, oh, why don't we look at it? Um, the, uh, in the foreground, you can see some figures very close to the camera. This was a, um, an abandoned building called the Turkish restaurant. And protesters kind of occupied the whole thing. And this was also really strategic for them. Like it helped keep the protesters safe. That gives them, and, so I was just um, in in Baghdad in um, October, right? I think a few months ago, um, and they just redid the whole square. Like they gave the the monument kind of a facelift. They redid the um, the actual kind of pavement, and people are seeing it as um, like that's nice. Like it's nice to restore the monument, but it's kind of a, it's a reclaiming it as a protest space. It's like no, no, we're going to put some nice new. Uh, gardens, you know, and little plants, and like, it's done. Like the protests here are done, and the there were talks about turning that abandoned building into some kind of like museum, especially for all the protesters who were killed. Probably not going to happen anytime soon. But so the symbolic visuals of that space are really powerful, and protesters wanted to control it, and the state wants to as well. Thank you. I have one. Uh, Dr. Walter, Alyssa, thank you for this lecture. It's um, amazing in its um, scope, but also the, the depth of the comprehension. Thank you so much for bringing your scholarship and your heart and your passion to all of this. Um, I have a question with, and we've had this conversation a little bit, but I'm curious, and I know it's it's risky, and you're probably not in a position to look into the crystal ball and, and, and have a sense of maybe what the future of Iraq is as... Um, as a Sh Shiite mm -hmm. uh, majority, but with with Iran so formidable as a neighbor, yeah. is there is there a good enough firewall in in the country of Iraq in terms of in infrastructure to be autonomous from the influence and militias and? Um... Yeah, right. So um, one of the reasons that um, it's important not just to talk about U.S. actions is because there are many other countries that have huge impacts on. Iraq and Iran is a major influence. I mean, um, they went from right the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s to being um, the closest country, and they they influence and kind of infiltrate Iraq quite a bit now. Um, and so it's tricky um, because Iraq's infrastructure is failing and its public systems are failing. They depend a lot on Iran, even for things like natural gas that Iraq should be producing, but hasn't because of the infrastructure of even its own oil uh, infrastructure, like does, isn't able to. So they are really reliant in that way. Um, but there's also, as part of like these protest movements, there has been a pushback to be like Iraq first. So even amongst Iraqi Shiites to say, we're Iraqi Shiites, we're not Iranian Shiites. And there's, there's been an exhaustion with foreign powers. So part of the Tishreen protest was like, no to America and no to Iran. Like, <laughs> can you please stay out? I don't know if, if you all remember this, right? But with the assassination, the US did a, a, a drone strike on an Iranian general, Qasem Soleimani, right? So you have America assassinating an Iranian in Iraq. And this is where Iraqis were like, stop, like enough, 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 right? Um, so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I will say the mood, uh, so my colleagues and I just did this round of interviews uh, in January. Um, so these are kind of really fresh public opinion um, opportunities. And um, the outlook right now is very, it's bleak. And this is where I said like, no matter how much you hated Saddam, people are like, I, things 
there were aspects of life that were better and at least under a dictatorship, I don't know, the dream of like someday we'll have freedom can kind of be kept alive. And part of the reason why there's been more stability in Iraq recently is actually because the corruption is so solidified that people don't need to fight about it anymore. It's like everyone has their piece of the pie and it's known, it's turf. You know, so you know which ministries you get to embezzle from and you get those ministries to embezzle from and it's all this. And um, the only time political violence has come up is actually when anyone has tried to, to change that. And so there was a prime minister who was put into power with these protests. He was supposed to be kind of the independent face of reforms and answer to the protesters. And he tried to like even just stick kind of a toe out to rein in some of these militias and they tried to assassinate him. And he was like, all right. So I think that's the problem now. It's hard to see how do you overhaul this whole system. It's not clear to me. I don't know if, yeah, Becky. Last question. Uh, wonderful job. Uh, is this on? <laughs> Okay, wonderful job, Dr. Walter. Um, I have a question about Iraqi identity, national identity. How do they really kind of see themselves as a people? Because you've talked about all the demographic and religious differences, and how can they unite around a national identity? Great question, really great question. So Iraq is a country that its modern borders were drawn by a British bureaucrat, right? So. So there's, sometimes you hear this thing about like, oh, they're arbitrary borders and this is part of the problem. And yeah, colonialism is a huge part of any problem. Like, yes, right? Like, let's, <laughs> we're gonna blame the British as long as we can. Um, <laughs> but Iraqis also push back against the idea of like, oh, it's an artificial state because they've lived now in these borders as a national community for well over a century. And so, they're like, we are Iraqi and we have our own unique history over a century that has shaped us into a country. And so um, after 2003, there were some American officials who were like, maybe we should redivide it. And they're like, no, no, stop, stop with the borders. This, okay. Um, but it's tricky. So um, sometimes they have, so like the Ba'ath Party leaned into being Arab. They're like, we're all Arab. So that way a Sunni, Shiite, Christian, but then the Kurds, right? And this is part of where they had such an awful relationship between Saddam and the Kurds. Um, sometimes Saddam would actually, he did a, as a history department, we can appreciate this. He had the rewriting history campaign in the 80s. They rewrote all the history textbooks to say, we are Mesopotamian. So they went ancient, right? And so, oh, did you catch uh, early? I had like, oh, these are some pictures of Saddam and like public murals and stuff. Did any of you catch that Saddam was on a chariot? Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. Saddam really was like, I'm the next Nebuchadnezzar. And so he went to Nebuchadnezzar's palace, which is in Babylon, which is in Iraq, and he wrote his name on every brick at eye level in this entire vast architectural, like, yeah, wrote his name all over it. And then he built his own palace on an artificial hill to be just above it. And there's more murals of him as Nebuchadnezzar in that palace, right? So that's where he was like, we'll go ancient. And maybe maybe that's one way forward, right? And so it's, it's both, um, or just to say, we're the country that's lived together in these borders for a hundred years. And that's very rocky that way, you know? I, the Kurdish, population, I think, will always have a really distinct view on this. They were promised their own country after World War I. They have long wanted their own country. But for the what we call federal Iraq, the rest of Iraq, I think there's a lot of ways to find that national identity in their shared history um, and in a lot of other parts of their shared culture. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it was wonderful. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Your, your research and your insights have provided us with much to think about and to reflect on.
And I've personally enjoyed the stories that you've shared and how you've used those stories to paint for me a more comprehens a comprehensive picture of life in Iraq, especially in the last 20 years. And as so it, it's been a great time for me. As you know, the Winifred E. Weeder Award is one of the highest awards given to a faculty member at Seattle Pacific University. This award was established to highlight, celebrate, and uphold the values of the liberal arts in a Christian university. Your work has certainly met that goal. Thank you. In honor of the work that you have done to remind us of the importance of the liberal arts in our curriculum, I present you with the Weeder Award Medallion. Can you? It's. <laughs> I, she can't really put it on because the strap wouldn't fit in the box. <laughs> so it's a beautiful award. Uh, <clears throat> the medallion, though small, recognizes your commitment to excellence in research and to the liberal arts. And each year you are encouraged to wear this medallion as part of your regalia so that we may all be reminded of the importance of the liberal arts in our curriculum. Thank you. Thank you.